Hello everyone. This is a introduction to the Gettysburg Address, which I teach in a couple of my courses. Um, this specific one will be for my Introduction to Human Communication course, where we go over uh, persuasive speaking um, and general public speeches. Uh, as far as uh, this primer, this introduction is concerned, there are plenty of uh, YouTube clips and books written on the Gettysburg Address where you can get more details. Uh, this is simply an introduction to um, to the address, so uh, it's going to be relatively quick here. Before you get going on listening to my explanation of this, uh, two quick things I want to mention. The first is that you should go to this YouTube uh, site, and I'll put this down in the description in the YouTube comments or in the YouTube description area. Uh, this is from a PBS series uh, that Ken Burns did a couple years ago on the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, which was in 2013. So this speech is given in 1863. And he did this program called Learn the Address. And he, uh, he, there's a documentary on, on this whole idea from this, um, this, this boys' school up in, the, in, in New England uh, where they have to learn the address in order to go from one grade to the next. But he also was going around challenging uh, people, specifically celebrities, politicians, etc., cetera, uh, to give the address and then post it up on YouTube. And this is the mashup version of it. Uh, and it's filled with former presidents and celebrities and congressional representatives and lots of famous people that you will know. The entire address is you know two minutes long, so I would definitely encourage you to watch it and really try to intently listen to it because some of the phrases – uh, within the within the speech we're going to get to in some of the upcoming uh, uh, slides. The second thing that I want to mention about the Gettysburg Address is it, it is usually taught in like a fourth grade history class uh, when we're learning about United States of America history. This is incomplete to what the Gettysburg Address actually did. So the way that I like to approach the Gettysburg Address with my students is to let them know that it is not just important in U.S. history with regard to the Civil War, but this address is actually extremely important uh, in world history. This is a world-changing speech. So that's one thing that we're going to cover here uh, in the upcoming slides to get it out of our head that, you know, the Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War was just a interesting unique historical moment in US history in the mid 1800s but this actually is a has huge world impact um, and and this is why they, we should sort of frame the Gettysburg address not just as an important US speech but a globally important world historical speech uh, so that's one of the things I kind of want to get out there as far as my approach to um, Lincoln and his Gettysburg address couple quick things we need some background on. First and foremost is why the Civil War started. Now, there's going to be plenty of people who I know, you know, dump all over this explanation. I'm perfectly fine with it. Uh, but the long and short of it is that the Civil War started over the issue of slavery. And you say, well, how? All right. This is this is how. Now, you can get into the, like, why did it continue and whether or not slave was important or keeping the union together. And I, I know people start slicing and dicing this stuff. Uh, but the Civil War started over the issue of slavery. So the United States had been in existence for, um, for, for around 80 years, and we did not have a civil war on the issue of slavery. So a question that would come up is, okay, then why did we um, go ahead and start a civil war on the issue of slavery if we hadn't had one in 80 years? So obviously slavery was a contentious issue all the way back to 1776, um, but we didn't start killing each other over it until uh, 1861, all right? What happens is that Abraham Lincoln is elected, and this is why the Civil War starts. It starts because we have a president who is elected to office whose entire platform is based on abolishing slavery. Prior to 1854, so we're going back six years before Lincoln's elected, we have two, part two major parties in the United States. We have the Democrat Party, and we have the Whigs. The Democrat Party was the pro-slavery party. All right, they're mostly in the South, and they are pro-slavery. And if they're not pro-slavery, they are pro-allowing uh, Southern states to vote and decide their own um, laws with regard to the issue of slavery. So the Democrat Party is very pro-slavery or allowing states to decide on the issue of slavery themselves. Then there's the Whig Party. The Whig Party is 
if we you know to to put it uh yeah the, the Whig party mostly is indifferent to the issue of slavery it's a lot of people who say you know what i'm not gonna have slaves it's mostly a northern party uh who says i'm not gonna have slaves but i'm just i'm not gonna interfere with other people's debates on slavery. i'm just gonna kind of stay out of the conversation right as a platform all right um lincoln does have a famous uh set of debates with a, a uh, an individual named stephen douglas uh a senator from illinois uh, this gets into things like uh, when we're expanding westward into places like Missouri, Kansas, and Nebraska um, on the issue of whether or not these new states who are now a part of the union should be free states or they should be slave states. For those who follow college basketball, there's a big back and forth between Kansas and Missouri. The basketball teams, Kansas is known as the free state because they voted way back when uh, to not have slaves and Missouri, um, they th continue uh, to throw it in Missouri's face uh, that Missouri decided to have slaves uh, when they were when they entered into the union. Stephen Douglas was a member of the Democrat Party. He was a senator from Illinois. He argued that states should be allowed to choose uh, whether or not they have slaves. Abraham Lincoln comes along and he debates Douglas for his Senate position. Um, and Lincoln says, no, slavery should not be allowed. Lincoln was saying, you know, slavery in the South, it's going to go away eventually. But as we add new states to the United States of America, those new states should not be allowed to have slaves at all. In this in these famous debates back and forth, um, Lincoln lost uh, to Douglas. So Douglas remained the senator from Illinois um, and Lincoln lost his Senate bid. But then a couple of years later in the 1860 election for president, uh, Lincoln and Douglas would face off again. Uh, and Lincoln, you know, Douglas as the Democrat nominee, Lincoln as a Republican nominee, and Lincoln would win, uh, um, obviously, the, the, the presidency here in, in 1860. So the 1860 Republican Party, uh, this is the first time the Republican Party is on a national stage. Uh, it's made up of a lot of people formerly of the Whig Party who essentially said, we're going to be a radical wing of the Whig Party, and we are going to create a um, abolition movement uh, platform within a major party. So again, Democrat Party is pro-slavery and Whigs are indifferent. There's a lot of Whigs who are like, no, we need a stronger stance. And so we now we have the Democrat Party that is the slave party, pro-slave party, and uh, the Republican Party comes along and says, no, the first line item on our agenda is abolishing slavery. The whole reason we're going to exist as a major party is to abolish slavery full stop. So this is why the Civil War happens. Prior to this, the South was kind of didn't really care that much uh, who was elected to office as long as um, because they knew that no one was going to take a strong stance against slavery. The 1860 Republican Party comes in for the first time and says, we're going to abolish slavery as soon as we get into office here. And now, as soon as the Republicans win the 1860 election with Abraham Lincoln, the South says, OK, these people are probably going to do exactly what they say they're going to do. So we as the South need to go secede from the Union. We're going to become a different country, and they're going to call themselves the Confederate States of America. Right. So this is the Confederacy. So the Republican Party threatened the entire economy, the entire culture, the entire so uh, social structure of the South. Um, and the South was worried because they were simply worried that the Republican Party was going to follow through on the platform that they had promised prior to 1860s. Just nobody had that anti, that that strong anti-slavery platform within the major party, um, and so this is why the Civil War starts. It does start on the issue of slavery. Lincoln was for the abolishment of slavery. The Republican Party platform of 1860 was abolish slavery. Um, and prior to that, nobody, you know, there wasn't a lot of buzz about ab abolishing slavery. It wasn't as strong. All right. So this is why the, the, the Civil War happens, and there's a lot of other ins and outs about keeping the Union together and, you know, Lincoln's personal beliefs on African Americans and, and, and slaves. That is tangential to the fact that the Civil War started over the issue of abolishing slavery. Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, the Battle of Gettysburg happens over a four-day period, July uh, 1st through the 3rd of 1863. The Civil War started in the spring of 1861. So Lincoln is inaugurated into office March of 1861. Um, inaugurations used to happen in March. Now they happen on January 20th. Um, so he's he's elected in 1860, but then he's inaugurated uh, and he's put into his presidency in March of 1861. Almost immediately afterwards, we have the first shots um, and the Civil War begins. So people mostly thought that the Civil War was going to be rather quick. Um, 
a, some some context for this is to think about you know today in, in the year 2020, we think about wars as something that happened thousands of miles away on a different continent um, with you know a small percentage of Americans actually engaged in them. The Civil War was something that happened on this tiny sliver of eastern coastline, right? And everyone was involved, right? This was a war that was literally fought in backyards, all right? So it was something that was like, was just front and center of everyone's life constantly. So people thought it was gonna be over rather quickly, but now the Civil War has drug on for two years. So when people initially got engaged in the Civil War, they said, no, we're gonna abolish slavery and we're gonna keep the Union together. The South, you aren't allowed to secede here. We're gonna you know, keep, the, keep all these states together here. But then Gettysburg comes along. And now we're two years into this war, everyone's involved, it's bloody, it's horrifying, and Gettysburg uh, is, becomes the most the, the deadliest battle here with 50,000 people dead over the course of just a few days. 50,000 people lost their lives at the, at the Battle of Gettysburg over just a couple of days. So now we're in this position two years into the Civil War where a lot of people, we'll stick with the North for a moment, a lot of people in the North are just saying, you know what, is this worth it? Maybe we do want to keep the union together. So maybe the compromise is go to the South and tell the South that they can keep their slaves. Right. So now we're kind of getting a shift in the narrative from abolishing slavery to we just want to end the war. And if the quickest way to end the war is allowing the South to keep their slaves, people are getting tired of the Civil War. Right. It dragged on for a lot longer than they expected, and a lot more people are dead than they expected. And they just say, you know what? Let's capitulate, tell the South to keep their slaves, end of story. And um, we'll go back to being a union and we can stop killing each other. Lincoln is not satisfied with this, right? So this is where like Lincoln's strong leadership comes in. Lincoln says, all right, I'm gonna go to Gettysburg. They're gonna have a memorial ceremony on November 19th, 1863, just a couple of months after the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, if we can think about sort of old time, you know, battlefield situations, we're talking about a lot of dead people, right, out in the middle of a field in summer heat. That's a long cleanup, right, with, you know, people collecting bodies and people burying bodies. Um, so people are going out to this field and there's still the, you know, atmosphere of a very bloody battle in the air. They have this memorial service uh, for those who had lost their lives in, in, in Gettysburg, and Lincoln is going out there to give uh, a, a speech to encourage people to continue fighting in the war. Again, people are tired of it. It's gone on for way too long. Lots of people are dead, and Lincoln needs to step up and say, look, I know that this is awful, but we need to have some sort of memorial that remembers the dead. And we also need to remember why the dead have, have, have given their lives. And if we quit now and we capitulate and say, you know what, South, you're allowed to keep your slaves. Lincoln saying like these dead, you know, would have died in vain, right? Because for the last two years, we basically had a war where nothing was accomplished because at the end of it, we just said, hey, you know what? Why don't you keep your slaves in the South? We won't have slaves in the North. And, um, there was no reason to have any of this fighting for the last two years. So Lincoln's going out there to give a rallying speech to continue on with this war in order to achieve the initial means of, of ending slavery and keeping the union together. All right. Uh, just a quick, some numbers here. The Civil War in total happened between uh, April of 61 to April of 65, where Lee surrenders to Grant at Appomattox. Officially, it's May of 1865 before we get all the paperwork done. We'll talk about this in, this is an important sort of distinction. We'll talk about this near the end. Approximately 620,000 Americans died, right, from both the South and the North. Um, in today's numbers, as far as today's population is concerned, that would be the equivalent of about 7 million Americans today. And again, this happened within the United States. This wasn't 7 million Americans being killed overseas. This was 7 million. This would have been the equivalent of 7 million Americans being killed within the, the United States in this period of just four years. Briefly, this guy named Edward Everett, uh, he was sort of the, you know, political newsman of the day. Um, 
And the the best equivalent we might have to understand him in the year 2020 is someone like Martin Luther King Jr., where he was his job was to travel around the country and give speeches um, about the news, but in a way that definitely had an agenda. Right. So he's sort of a news and news commentator type of person. Right. But he was just a, he traveled around. Right. Today, you know, you turn on Fox or MSNBC, you get the news with political conversation behind it. Um, that's sort of what Edward Everett was. Uh, but because he traveled more, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., which is kind of, you know, every day he's in a different city, giving a speech at a church about civil rights. Um, it's talking about the news of the day, but sort of in this like and we have an agenda in order to you know, accomplish these these goals. Edward Everett was kind of like that. He speaks at Gettysburg. Right. And he's well known. He speaks at Gettysburg um, and his speech goes on for two hours, which is about 20,000 words. So if you are in my class, imagine writing a 50 page paper, right? 50 pages, double spaced. That's about 20,000 words. All right. He gives this speech and he's famous and well known. Once his speech is over, Abraham Lincoln's going to speak next. So now we have to think, you know, what's the mentality of people um, when they're out there in this memorial service, right? So they've just been standing or maybe sitting for two hours listening to Edward Ever give a speech. He's the opening act. And now we're going to have Lincoln come up, who's going to be like the big act. Like that's what everyone's, you know, why everyone's there to listen to the president talk. So Edward Everett stops, and in between his speech and Lincoln's speech, there's probably a little bit of, um, you know, wrestling around, right? People are kind of getting up, they're stretching their legs, or getting something to eat, they're using the restroom, right? They're kind of moving around a little bit, and they know that they have a little bit of time because they think, you know what, Edward Everett just gave a two-hour speech. Even if I miss the first few minutes of Lincoln's speech to go use the restroom or go get a sandwich or whatever it is I need to do, right? He's going to be talking for a while, so I'm not going to miss all of Lincoln's speech. So there's this like, you know, just rustling around in the crowd. People are kind of getting comfortable. Nobody is really ready for Lincoln's speech when it starts because no one thinks they have to be ready for Lincoln's speech when it starts because they think Lincoln's going to speak for a while. What we know about the Gettysburg Address is that Lincoln only speaks for about two minutes, which is a total of 273 words, right? Half a page. All right. So when Lincoln gave his speech, nobody was really sort of hunkered down, ready to pay attention, right? Even the news who was there, right, the, the, the journalists, the photographers, they weren't really ready to kind of take notes. So we have, I think there's about five different versions of the Gettysburg Address, um, and we don't have any speeches of Lincoln, or we don't have any pictures of Lincoln at the podium. The only picture we have of Lincoln at Gettysburg is right here. You can see this arrow, and you can see uh, his head right here, right? Um, that's the only picture we have of Lincoln, right? And they, they suspect that this picture was taken uh, when he first got there. So he's kind of like in the crowd near the podium, right? But we don't have any pictures of him at the podium, again, because the news wasn't really ready. Uh, the photographers were like, well, he's going to be up there for a while. I'll get a picture of him some point, right? Uh, the crowd wasn't really ready to hear everything. So people were talking about, you know, reported later that it was difficult to hear him or understand because people were still kind of, you know, settling, da settling back down from listening to Edward Everett for two hours, so Lincoln gets up, gives a speech, and it's over before most people even know that it's over, all right? Most people, excuse me, it's over before most people even know it started, all right? So as I discussed on the first slide, the Gettysburg Address is important not only to U.S. history, but it's also important to the world. So let's break down what that was. So one of the lines from Lincoln's speech, which is probably my favorite line uh, for because it unpacks so much, right? And again, it's a very short speech, but there's so much context in this that people overlook. So Lincoln says the following, now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. So the question becomes, okay, we're in, this, we're in this middle of a civil war, right? Four score and seven years ago. So 87 years ago, a score is 20 years. 87 years ago, we were, we sort of, we, we created this nation conceived, right? Uh, in this idea. And, you know, if you have the context, it's conceived in liberty. All right. And we're testing whether or not a nation conceived in liberty can long endure, all right? So now you have to say, well, what is liberty? A lot of people use the word liberty, right? But they don't have a good definition of it. Liberty is self-governance, right? Self, uh, self-governance of yourself and then self-government where people elect other individuals to kind of come together and represent their individual rights, right? And in the Declaration of Independence, we have this idea of nature and nature's God. So you say, well, where do these rights come from? They come from the fact that you're just born, like you are a born free human. So you have these rights from birth. 
So this is what Lincoln is saying. He's like, we are conceived in this idea of liberty and we've been dedicated in this idea of liberty. And we did this 87 years ago. And now this is where world history comes in. We're engaged in a civil war. And as soon as we told the world in 1776 that we are going to be conceived in this idea of self-government, where individuals can just sort of live their own lives, as long as you don't hurt other people or take other people's stuff, right? As long as you just like leave everyone else alone, we're going to let people who are uneducated, who are not powerful, um, we're, we're going to let them be involved and take care of their own affairs, right? We're not going to have these like little lords and dukes all over the place governing people from like Washington, D.C. It's like, look, you want to have a little city out in the middle of nowhere, elect your own mayor, fine. Like just we're going to leave you alone. You know, you leave us alone. This is a radical idea in 1776. And what Lincoln is saying is now we are four score and seven years, 87 years later, we're in a civil war and the whole world is looking at us saying, hey, you know what? We were right. This idea of liberty is not possible, right? Uneducated you know, people cannot take care of themselves. And it took 87 years, but now we see that they're actually fracturing and falling apart. So Lincoln gives a speech that says, 87 years ago, we're conceived in liberty and the whole world in 1776 says, you are out of your mind. You cannot do this, right? This is not gonna last. And now we're in a civil war and the whole world is looking at the United States of America and saying, we told you so. We knew that you could not do this. You need hierarchies, you need monarchs, you need a few people in charge directing everybody around. You cannot have self-governments. Self-government is a, a, you know, it's a fairy tale. All right, so this is where Lincoln's speech is rooted, saying we have to, so, so we have to complete the Civil War, keep the Union together, abolish slavery so that we can send a message to the world that liberty is possible. Because if we get involved in a Civil War, right, 87 years after this country was founded and the whole country falls apart, liberty will never be tried anywhere else in the world for an extremely long time. So the, the results of the Civil War isn't just a question of whether or not the United States is going to hang on to slaves, whether or not the United States is going to um, stay together as a union. The outcome of the Civil War is actually this world event that everyone's looking at that says like, can a country conceived in liberty, can it stay together? If the North wins, other people are gonna be inspired and say, wow, I guess you can do this idea of self-government. I guess liberty can exist. If the United States falls apart, Every other nation thinking about freedom and liberty is going to look at and say, you know what, some other country tried it and they tore themselves apart and it's not possible. So Lincoln knows that this is important for the world because the world wants to see if liberty is possible. So how did nations operate before the United States? Monarchs, tyrants, dictators, they gave you your rights. They told you what you could and couldn't do. The United States comes along and says, no, self-government is possible. Uh, if you want to know more about this, I have a whole PowerPoint on the Constitution. You can learn about this idea of you know positive rights and negative rights. I'll leave um, a description down in the in the YouTube description place. All right. So if the North loses, right, all these monarchs and tyrants around the world say, look, we can't give our people individual rights um, because the North lost and the United States tore itself apart. It took 87 years, longer than we thought, but liberty is not possible. So Lincoln wants people to know that liberty is possible. All right, testing, we're, we are testing whether or not a nation conceived in liberty can long endure. And if it can endure, we can change world history, right? We can change the way in which so many other countries go about treating their people and engaging in um, elections and giving people rights, right? If the United States tears itself apart, I guess liberty is not possible. I guess you can't give people the ability to kind of freely live their lives and people need, you know, these tyrants, um, you know, sort of dictating everything that they do with themselves. So what type of government does the United States have? We have a Republican form of government and get away from the, get, I, I know people start arguing and stuff, especially on YouTube, like get away from the, the party labels for a second, right? What a Republican form of government means is that first and foremost, you protect the rights of the individual right? Not the good of the collective. Um, so this was one of Lincoln's arguments when he was debating Stephen, uh, Stephen Douglas for the, for the Senate. Um, there was a question of whether or not blacks and whites were, were equal. Were, the, were they the same? Uh, were they the same? And, and Lincoln, he did uh, obfuscate on the question, 
right? So there are ways in which Lincoln definitely had ideas that are extremely not okay, especially by today's standards. Um, but Lincoln's big thing was, look, if a person works all day, right? And now he's talking about um, a slave in the South, for instance. Lincoln said, if a person works all day, that individual should have the right to keep the fruits of his labor, right? So he sort of like kind of, you know, hemmed and hawed around the question, like are blacks and whites equal as far as like human beings? Um, and he's sort of turned and just said, look, I'm not going to answer that question. But what I do think is that uh, if someone works all day, they should have the individual right to keep the fruits of their labor. And so this is why, you know, slavery is awful. Right. Um, so this is what a republic form of government does. It protects the rights of the individual no matter what. So you so you have Stephen Douglas who comes along and says, well, you know, if Missouri wants to take a vote and they all democratically say, hey, we all vote uh, for slavery to exist. Um, that's the good of the collective. And Lincoln says, I don't care. I don't care if the entire country votes yay for slavery. Lincoln says those individuals have rights and you cannot take away individual rights through a vote. All right. Individuals have rights regardless of what the majority says. So if you say you live in a democracy, you don't live in a democracy of United States citizen, right? Democracy say majority wins. And sometimes the majority stands up and says, we're going to vote to take your rights away. And Lincoln says, no, individuals have rights regardless of what the majority says. All right, so here we have some stuff with republic versus democracy again. Even if the majority votes to enslave an individual, that individual has rights, All right? So this is um, Lincoln's argument as well as the Republican Party, obviously the word republic is in it, right? You can't vote a way to take away somebody's individual rights. Same thing is true with liberty and democracy, right? So liberty, you as an individual are sovereign. As long as you don't hurt other people, you should be able to freely live your life however you want to. You have you know, self-governance, right? You're in charge of your life and the tyranny of the majority, so people voting, right? The majority, they cannot take those rights away from you, all right? So as long as you don't hurt anyone, the majority should not be able to vote and say, well, we're gonna take your, we're gonna take your rights away from you. Uh, in the United States, uh, you can go through my constitution video again down in the description here. Um, for a longer explanation, but long story short, negative rights are things that governments and kings, get, or excuse me, negative rights are things that the Constitution has. Um, positive rights are things that governments uh, and kings might give to you. So one of my big pet peeves is when people go around and say the Constitution gives me the right to speak freely. And what I say is the Constitution doesn't give you the right to do anything. The Constitution already assumes that you have those rights. The Constitution is a letter to the government that says, dear government, you cannot infringe upon those rights. Um, uh, and again, you can go check out my constitution video for, for more on this, right? But the United States has negative rights, right? Um, and let's see what this looks like. So if you see the first amendment, you know, Congress, the government shall make no law, um, a well-regulated uh, militia, the right to people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The constitution is a list of things that the government cannot do to you. Um, there you have it, right? Again, more stuff in the Constitution video. Abbreviated timeline for um, what's going on in the Civil War. So again, the Civil War starts uh, uh, starts in 1861, uh, and it goes through Link Lincoln's entire presidency uh, is the Civil War. He's elected, the Civil War starting, the, the, he's elected, South is seceding from the Union, Civil War starts, and it goes on for Lincoln's entire presidency. In January of 1863, Lincoln signs the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, which is over here. What the Emancipation Proclamation is, uh, it's an executive order that the president signs that says, hey, you know what? Slavery is ended. Now, this is an important document because it's, it's the first time a president says no more slavery. So it's important for that reason. But it's also a political move uh, because executive orders don't hold eternal weight. And what I mean by this is that executive orders are only good for as long as the, that president who signed them is in office. So historically, what happens with executive orders um, is, an, is a president will sign an executive order, and then the next person who comes into the office uh, is just going to like rescind all of them and say, yeah, all those executive orders the last guy signed, I didn't like him, so I'm going to just get rid of those again. So the Emancipation Proclamation, it's important that a president puts his signature on a thing that says no slavery. But people also know that the Emancipation Proclamation might not hold a lot of weight in uh, a couple years from now when the next when when if Lincoln's not reelected, if a if a Democrat president comes into power uh, in 1865. So executive orders are only good for as long as the, the person who is in charge uh, is in office. 
All right. Um, we'll come back to this momentarily. In November of 63, Lincoln gives the Gettysburg Address, right? So Lincoln has done two controversial things now prior to his reelection. He signs an Emancipation Proclamation that says, I'm going to free all the slaves, right? And there's a question of, well, if the next president comes in and takes this executive order back, does that mean all those free slaves now have to go return to slavery? So this is an open question that's going to be difficult to answer after the next election. Lincoln also gives the Gettysburg Address, which again is a rallying cry. Everyone in the North is like, let's go home. We're tired of this war. And Lincoln says, no, we have to stay the course. We're a nation conceived in liberty and we are on a world stage right now. And the entire world is looking at us to figure out, are they going to tear themselves apart or are they going to stick together? And if the South wins, if we become two different countries, the United States and the Confederacy, um, or if we capitulate and say, you know what, we had this war and the South, you can keep your slaves and the North won't have slaves. Lincoln's like, there was no reason to have this war at all. You know, tens of thousands of people have died already at Gettysburg. Hundreds, hundreds of thousands are going to die before this thing is over. And the whole world is going to look at us and think that we're a big joke. Lincoln says, we have to stay. So he has sort of recommitted to staying engaged in the Civil War, even though so many people in the North don't want to be in the Civil War anymore. So free the slaves and stay involved in the war in a war that's very unpopular. Lincoln's done a lot of very, um, made some, some very hard political decisions uh, that he's going to stand by. A year after his Gettysburg Address, he's reelected. So this is where Lincoln's like, all right, I put everything on the line. I signed a controversial Emancipation Proclamation and I signed or and I gave this Gettysburg Address that was controversial because it told people we're going to stay in a war that where, where people are dying all the time that is happening in your backyard. I'm going to stay engaged in a war that's happening in your backyard. And people reelected him and said, all right, you made two controversial decisions. They were very hard decisions, but I guess you're going to get reelected and we support those decisions. So Lincoln takes this as an opportunity to say, I guess the people are behind me. I guess the people also want these things. So we're going to keep pushing forward even harder on this issue of abolishing slavery and winning the Civil War. All right. So uh, in January of 65, so um, he's, he's been reelected, but he hasn't started his second term again. His second term officially starts in March at the second inaugural. All right. But in January of 65, uh, he gets the House of Representatives to pass the 13th Amendment. So now the Emancipation Proclamation, the executive order, becomes permanent. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. All right. Um, so the Emancipation Proclamation is now permanently in, uh, engraved in the 13th Amendment. And it says, you know, no slavery is allowed in the United States. So now we have a question. If we get the Confederacy to come back into the United States, now the Confederacy has to agree to the rules of the Constitution. And we have this new thing in the Constitution called the 13th Amendment. That's going to say no slaves. All right. So now bringing the country back together, north and south, um, it's going to be even this stronger sort of no slavery. There's, there's not even an opportunity now. At the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln could have said, you know what? Keep the slaves in the south, no slaves in the north, and we'll just end the war. Now we have finalized no slavery in the south. So if we do get the country back together at the end of the Civil War, the south is going to have to come back and they're going to be like, oh, crap. They wrote a bunch of new rules into the Constitution, and one of those rules is no slavery, All right? So now it's not even a debate. Um, it's not even, yeah, it's, it's not even this sort of like negotiation as to whether or not slavery is going to be allowed um, once the 13th Amendment passes. And then finally, all right, and this is where I talked about on a few slides ago where um, uh, on April 7th, all right, so let's go back here. On April 7th of 65, General Lee of the South surrenders to General Grant of the North, surrenders at Appomattox, all right? So at this point, the war is sort of de facto over, all right? A week later, on April 14th, Lincoln is assassinated, all right? And he's assassinated by this guy named John Wilkes Booth, who I'm sure you've heard from fourth grade, you know, social studies class. John Wilkes Booth is a Southern sympathizer, right? Like the South will rise again. He's one of those guys. He is motivated by the fact that Lee just surrendered. So again, I, back on like the first slide, I said like the Civil War is not officially over till May. So what happens is Lee surrenders April 7th and John Wilkes Booth has this idea in his head. He's like, 
well, the war's not officially over yet. So if I can go and assassinate Abraham Lincoln, right? And there's there's this conspiracy to take out Lincoln's entire cabinet, vice president, secretary of state, all that kind of stuff. But stick stick with the basics here. Lee surrenders on April 7th. John Wilkes Booth says, okay, if I can assassinate Abraham Lincoln, maybe that'll be motivation for all of these Southerners to get back engaged with the Civil War because the paper, we haven't signed treaties yet. So that's what, that's, part of Booth's motivation. Lee failed us. General Robert E. Lee failed us as a leader. I'm going to go in. I'm going to assassinate the president, and that is going to reinvigorate the South, the South will rise again kind of stuff, get those people back on the battlefield to keep engaged in the Civil War because we officially haven't lost it yet. Um, I, again, we, we finally signed the paperwork in, in May of 65, right? So that's Booth's motivation is like keep the Civil War going even though our general has surrendered. Um, it's not a done deal yet. This is like one last Hail Mary pass to kind of keep the South going. Lincoln is shot on April 14th uh, at Ford's Theater, uh, and then he dies a little after 7 a.m. Uh, the next morning on April 15th. Um, that, that's when he died. So that's why I have two different dates here for his assassination. He shot on the night of the 14th. He officially dies uh, a little after 7 a.m. Uh, on the 15th. 